Hello and welcome to Art History Survey 2. I wanted to start us off by uh, going over some important terminology that you'll find in textbooks and writings related to art history, and it kind of helps if we're all on the same page in terms of how we're using these ideas. Um, so the terminology you'll see here has a slightly different meaning when we're talking about art history than it might in other disciplines. So we just want to make sure we're all um, using the same kind of language and that you know what is being implied by the terms that are being used in the textbook. So our first important term here is form, and form is a term that we use to indicate anything that contributes to the visual appearance of a piece of art. So we're not talking about anything in terms of subject matter or emotional meaning or content. We're talking just in objective terms about how the things look. Um, is a piece of art big or small? Is it two-dimensional, three-dimensional? Um, is it rough or smooth? Is it black and white or does it have color? Those are all formal issues, issues of form. When we talk about content, we can break that down as a concept. Content is what the art contains, if you will. Um, we can break that into two parts, the subject matter and the meaning. So subject matter is just what is being depicted, what's being shown to you. Um, what the art is of, what is it an image of? That's a question of subject matter. And very much like we do in English class, the subject of the sentence is the noun. When we're talking about subject matter and visual art, we're trying to talk about it without a lot of emotion. We're trying to look just for bare bones depiction, description of what is being shown to you. What are the nouns? What are the main subjects? Now, some artwork will not have uh, recognizable subjects. We'll talk about that a little bit later. The meaning and theme and message, though, are pretty important um, things to consider. The idea of content in terms of meaning can also be kind of taken apart in two ways. We can think about what the artist intends for you to understand. What is their meaning? What did they want to say? And then, of course, there's your interpretation. You might get exactly what the artist was trying to say, or you might interpret from your own point of view, from your own experience, your own um, way of seeing the world, you might interpret a piece differently from how the artist intends it. So meaning is where we get into a little bit more of a gray area. This is where the emotional side can come in, where your personal subjective view can come in. We try to keep it very formal and, and objective when we're talking about form, line shape, color, texture, those kind of things we can all agree on. Subject matter is usually pretty easy to pick out in terms of not an emotional interpretation, but just identifying subject. When we get into meaning and message, we want to remember, though, that there could be a disconnect between what the artist intends and what we personally get from it ourselves. So thinking of these terms, um, assuming that this is a great piece of art in a museum or a gallery, I just stole it off the web, but we'll pretend it's a piece of art on the wall. And again, we could talk about this in terms of form. Um, obviously, the technique that it is made with is photography. It's a color photograph. Physically, the object itself would be smooth to touch, but it does seem to suggest textures of uh, grass, leaves, the hair and fur, obviously. When we talk about subject matter, no question. As human beings, we're going to key on people first most of the time. So we're going to see a human being, child, secondary subject, the dog. When we talk about content in terms of message, we can assume or guess that the person who took the photograph was trying to show the relationship between the child and the pet, and that that's probably something they see as positive. I'd be really hard pressed at this point to convince you that there was a big bigger thematic message than that, that there was some like definitive social statement or cultural statement about this. This is arguably a nice, well-composed photograph of a kid and their dog. And that's great if you like dogs, you're going to feel one way about it. If you're scared of dogs, you might feel a different way. But it certainly doesn't feel like a significant, massively important cultural statement. Take a look at this, though. This is a photograph, arguably, of a kid and a dog. It's very similar to what we just saw, but it feels very different. 
Obviously, in terms of form, it's different because it's black and white. It's also different because it's not a photograph with a camera. It is a still image from a motion picture or a television recording. Um, it's also different slightly in terms of the subject matter. Um, the kid does seem to be um, more of the focus in some ways. We can see his face. But still, when we're looking at subject matter, we are seeing primarily child and dog. The content or the message is where it really, truly is deeply different. And it's only different if we know certain things about the culture that it came from. You may already have recognized these characters from American 20th century pop culture as Timmy and Lassie. Lassie, the heroic dog who's always saving Timmy from danger. If you know American pop culture, you know that Lassie is essentially a symbol for heroism and loyalty uh, and this like constant, um, unwavering, brave, loyal uh, love between the pet and the human being. Um, that's really what Lassie's all about. Lassie's been saving Timmy in literature, in television shows, in movies for decades now. But if you don't know that, if you're not either part of American culture or you haven't studied that part of American culture, you might just see this as kid and dog and not see it as having all of these other levels of American symbolic emotional meaning. So the reason I like to show this at the beginning of the semester is just to remind you that we're going to be looking at art that is not from our own time period or our own culture. We won't automatically know just by glancing at it what the meaning behind it is from the point of view of the person who made it. So it is really inherent that we understand it's important that we take the time to learn about the culture that we are looking at the artwork of in order to really be able to appreciate it. Some things might not have the same kind of uh, resonance if we don't know the backstory, if we don't know where they come from. We can also talk about the term style. This is one that we throw around a lot. Style is just those attributes that a group of art objects have in common. Um, you certainly could see this term being used in terms of fashion or even more easily, I think, with music. Um, we could talk about popular music. Um, pop stars of the last 20 years have a kind of particular group of attributes in common, a certain kind of sound or approach is kind of typical to the time period. That's what we're trying to look at here now with visual art. So these go from very broad to super specific. We could talk about style as it applies to the art of an entire culture. Some cultures don't change their style significantly um, over the course of hundreds and hundreds of years. We could talk about within a culture, the art of a particular time maybe a 200 or 100 year period during which artists collectively made things in a similar way. You could look within a time period at a group of artists who uh, work and think in a similar way. Uh, we could look at the work of just one artist on his own or her own, how they make the work that they make and they have their own voice, their own style. Or you could look at the work of an artist at a particular point in their career, their their style might change over time. Certainly the last three sets are very um, familiar to us. You could think about artists who have things in common musically. Katy Perry, Lady Gaga, Ariana Grande have some similar approaches. Um, you could throw Taylor Swift in there, I suppose. The more recent work is kind of similar to what all of those people are doing. But each of them could be picked out as having certain things that they do different from one another. You could look at Gaga and say some of the times she sounds a little more like a country singer. The Joanne album is really different from Chromatica, just as an example. So let's take a look at how those work in terms of visual art. The art of Egypt pretty much didn't change for about 2,000 years. The example at the far right is a carving from the foundation of the Egyptian culture. And the painting here from a 
Book of the Dead is separated from this one by about 1,500 years. So when you look at the styles there, the way the figures are drawn, the portions, the poses even, are identical to this kind of model. Once the Egyptians uh, settle on how the figure is going to be presented, that really stays unchanged for the most part for about 2,000 years, style of an entire culture. We certainly can see similarities in these images. Although they're done by different artists, these are both early Renaissance paintings in Italy. The style has certain things in common, the types of colors, the direction of the light, the use of a sense of three-dimensional uh, illusion on the bodies, the sense of a three-dimensional space that the figures are in. All of these are attributes they have in common throughout that period. We could then look at a group of artists within a time period. In the 1950s, the artists of the abstract expressionist movement made subject matter less important and formal use of the materials more important. They called themselves action painters. So they were more interested in how the paint got on the surface than on making a painting that depicted a specific subject. So Jackson Pollock's painting is really similar to that of his wife. You see here on the left, Pollock's painting, Blue Poles. On the right, you see Lee Krasner in her studio, one of her later works. They're similar to each other. They're distinct from other, but at the same time, they have quite a lot in common. It's the art of a group of artists with similar goals. We can certainly talk about the art of a single artist at one point in their um, or rather developing an idea across their entire adult career. This is the work of Edward Hopper, whose style stays pretty much unchanged throughout his adult career. Versus Richard Diebenkorn, who's an American painter who changed his style pretty dramatically. He did figurative work and then changed to this very abstract um, geometric form near the end of his career. We also want to look at some terms that people sometimes confuse. The term representational can be confusing for people. Representational doesn't mean that it's photographically realistic. Representational just means the image depicts something that we can agree on seeing in reality. So these are two portraits by two different artists. They're male figures with curly-ish hair. They're definitely human beings, but you would never mistake the one on the right for a photograph. The one on the left is a painting, believe it or not, but it's so believable it almost looks like it could be a black and white photograph. Even though they're different in style, because they represent, and we can clearly all see and agree that they represent something from the real world, they are representational. These two examples are also both representational, but the painting on the left has obviously been abstracted. She's more um, hyper-colored, things are simplified and exaggerated, details are deleted, she's changed from reality. The figure on the right is much more what you expect to see in the real world. So I like to use the term naturalism rather than realism. Naturalism or naturalism um, rather than realistic. And the reason I do that is because there is a specific style of painting in France in the 1850s called realism. Uh, so to make sure that we're not confusing ourselves about time period, instead of realistic, I usually try to say naturalistic. It looks more like nature. So the image on the left looks more like the natural world. Uh, Rather, the image on the right looks more like the natural world. Image on the left looks less so. We also sometimes throw the term abstract around the wrong way. Most people, when they say abstract, means that it looks crazy, messed up, there's no subject. But really what we mean is that an abstract image has been changed or altered from reality. So the image on the left here looks very much like the real world. We can say it is more naturalistic, it is less abstract. The figure on the right is definitely altered, changed. Details are deleted, things are simplified, things are exaggerated, the colors are intensified. She's more abstract. So abstraction implies that a change has made to something in the real world to abstract it, to change it into something else. This is what most people mean when they say abstract art. In this case, this is not an image that's meant to represent anything other than lines, colors, values, shapes. 
when we see this kind of thing, instead of calling it abstract, it's more appropriate for us to refer to this type of work as non-objective. There's no subject. Abstraction means abstracting from something, changing from reality. In this case, this is just an image about form, line, shape, color, texture. So non-objective is a more appropriate term. If you look at these artworks all together and think of it like a sliding scale or a spectrum, then you'll see that most of the art that we're going to look at is going to fall on the left-hand side of the screen. That's going to be our representational category. It represents something from the real world. Further to the left is more naturalistic, less abstract. Further toward the right, less naturalistic, more abstract. But once you cross this borderline here, you really are in the realm of artwork that has no subject or is non-objective. We definitely can see some differences here, right? If I show you these two sculptures side by side, if you don't have any information other than the image that you see in front of you, it's pretty easy to see the image on the left represents people at a coffee shop. The figure on the right, that sculpture is hard to, to assess at first. If you thought the title was Dancer, you might think it was representational of a human body, but the title of that piece is Untitled Number 76. It's not meant to be anything. That's fully non-representational. This is a sculpture as well, though, that uh, sculpture on the right is fully three-dimensional. You can walk all the way around it. Um, it's not a snapshot of tourists. It's a fully three-dimensional object. What you're seeing here really are two pairs of representational subjects in sculpture. You could argue that the one on the left is more abstract. People are not starkly white, like the color of white plaster. The one on the far right is definitely more naturalistic, less abstract. In this case, both of these sculptures are fully non-representational. We definitely want to think a little bit also about how to discuss artwork in terms of comparing um, two pieces of art one to the other and finding the things they have in common and talking about things that they do not share in common. That's easier to do if you look at a pop culture example. I like to use this sometimes in class because it does usually get a bit of a laugh. Um, I realize it's a little dated at this point, but these are obviously visual um, motion picture forms of entertainment, right? And there are certain things that these two franchises have in common. The Twilight franchise is about people who at least look young, who are in a love triangle. And the Jersey Shore reality TV show was definitely about young people and their sort of sexual romantic exploits, some similarities there. But it's easy to pick apart the difference. Twilight is fictional. It's a film franchise based on a series of novels. The Jersey Shore show was arguably reality TV, television versus movie, reality versus fiction. You could really start to break down similarities and differences when it's something silly like this, when it's something pop culture. Right? Easily you could tell your friends the difference between your two favorite bands or your two favorite movie franchises. It's not really that much of a stretch to do the same thing when we talk about differences and similarities between visual artwork. Look at the thing and think about it on a basic level. Does it have similar colors? Is the subject matter similar? These are things that you can think about and best as ways of helping you understand the differences between different styles as art develops over time. Not that you have to have had Art History 1 before you take Art History Survey 2, but some of the things you might have missed if you haven't had Art Survey 1, I want to just cover quickly so you have an idea of where we're starting. Art History Survey 2 starts in the Renaissance. So the Renaissance literally means rebirth. It is the rebirth of classical art. Classical for us means the art of Greece and Rome. So we're bringing back something from the past. So you want to know a little bit about what that art was like. Well, the ancient Greeks created sculpture um, that arguably became from a fairly abstract kind of form of the human body, increasingly more naturalistic, began to look more and more like the real world. So clearly the example of the female figure at the far right 
feels closer to what we're going to see in the Renaissance. The Greeks, though, definitely painted their sculptures. This is a sort of reproduction digitally of what this statue would have looked like. The female statues, for the most part, really until the very end of the Greek era, are clothed. And they're usually clothed in a heavy garment known as the peplos. The peplos kind of hugs the body, minimizes some of the curves, makes the body more of a column. Uh, weirdly enough, the sculpture in ancient Greece, the male figures are almost always nude and the female figures are almost always clothed. There was an attitude in Greek culture that uh, women, by virtue of being more emotional, were less rational. They were um, imperfect in comparison to rational men. So strangely, the male figure was always presented as a athletic, youthful, masculine, muscular figure, and the female figure's um, kind of femininity was often reduced, especially through the use of the peplos garment. The male figures, though, are kind of interesting to see how they progress as well from the figure on the far left that does feel somewhat abstract to the figure on the far right that looks a lot more like what we think the human body really looks like. Obviously, the artists are looking at human anatomy and they're becoming a little bit more sensitive to making the, especially hands, feet, the joints, look at the kneecaps, for instance, are becoming more and more believable. However, the Greeks were also interested in what we call idealism. They wanted to show people at their peak of perfection. And so for the Greeks, they really favored this kind of calm, cool, rational, non-emotional approach um, that they felt was best expressed through the male figure in its muscular peak and usually in a youthful way. So it would not be unusual for a statue, a monument of you being placed at or near your graveside to not depict how you looked as an old person, but to depict you as a vigorous, youthful um, athlete from the earliest stage of your life. They really were interested in kind of perfection. Think about the way that we depict superheroes in drawn comic book form, right? Their bodies are always hyper musculature. Um, that is very much what the Greeks are trying to present to us as well as kind of the concept of the perfect human. In other words, the person at their absolute physical peak, mental peak, the best citizen, the best warrior, the best business person, it's all about trying to present the absolute um, pinnacle of perfection. They also, though, wanted things to look real, and that's why I put up this example from ancient Greece beside this example, uh, sorry, ancient Egypt beside this example from ancient Greece. Notice that the space here between the legs in the Egyptian statue has not been carved away, and yet the Greek example is fully carved in that space. You also notice that as this figure takes a step forward was an innovation of ancient Egypt that made the figures feel more alive, but actually it's physically impossible. You can't actually put your foot flat on the ground ahead of you like this and simultaneously keep your back leg in a complete straight line with your spine. Try standing against the wall and taking a step forward. You won't be able to touch the ground unless your body comes off the wall and balances you over empty space. That's what's happening here. The figure is literally being liberated from a block of marble into something more closely resembling what a human body does. The minute we do that, though, when we balance this mass of the body over these thin ankle points, you can see now why so many of the statues are broken because they quite frankly would snap if they fell over and they are going to break at the narrowest points, knees and ankles in particular. But that's because the Greeks were trying so hard to make the figures feel more natural. We also see Greek sculptors beginning to have a rule or set of rules for proportions, which is referred to as the canon of proportion. Um, it's usually ascribed to the sculptor Polyclitus, and we see it a lot in his figure, the Deriferous. This is a Roman copy of his original. But the measurement of the figure's head to his overall height, proportional relationship, one head unit times seven equals the overall height is considered the perfect ideal human proportion. 
in the Greek canon. And you'll see that that proportion continues across generations after Polyclitus establishes this set of rules. It's followed by all the Greek artists after him. In fact, it's kind of odd, but these two figures almost look as if they could be the same person. They're not. They're by two different artists, and they present two different human beings, much in the same way that we have kind of a formula for how to draw uh, Marvel superheroes, for instance. The bodies are all kind of the same, and then the costumes change. That's sort of the same thing that's happening here with these Greek examples. The term contraposto is one you definitely want to know. Contraposto means weight shift, and you do not see it happening here, but you definitely see it here. As that figure takes a step forward, you can also see that the weight of the body is held on one leg, and that hip is higher than the leg that's loose, the leg that isn't carrying the weight. And then there's a counterbalance of that weight of the body to keep us from falling over. If this leg on the left of the screen here, if this is the leg carrying the weight, that arm is loose, this arm is engaged, which tilts the shoulders the opposite direction from the tilt of the hips and creates this S-shaped curve in the spine, which is much more natural to the way human beings actually stand. It's really rare that anyone would stand like this with equal weight on both feet and rimrods straight up and down, completely straight across the shoulders and across the hips. This feels much more like the way we actually behave. The Greeks also are known for restrained emotion in their depictions of themselves, but notice this kind of animalistic rage in the faces of the figures that are symbolically their enemies. These are from uh, frieze sculptures, kind of uh, bands of sculpture along the top of a temple that really show the difference between the Greek approach to religion and society. The Greeks believed they were more Apollonian, more like the god Apollo, stoic, civilized, intellectual, emotionless. And then they depicted their enemies as followers of Dionysus, drunken, emotional, wild, overtly animalistic. So when you look at these, you can see they understand emotion, they can express it, but they're almost demonizing it. Emotion and excess is the other. Rational control even in an extreme situation, is very Greek. Look how calm she is about being carried off by a centaur. She looks rather relaxed for the extreme of the situation that she's in. As we get toward the end of the Greek era, we have the period we know as the Hellenic. The Hellenistic era shows a great um, increase in the use of emotion and in loosening the figures, giving us a little bit less stiff proportions and stiff poses. This is actually a sculpture that commemorates the death of an enemy soldier. The uh, Greeks fought the Gauls. The Gauls were um, barbarians to them, and you can see that in his facial hair and his wild hair that he has. But you can also see that there's a grudging amount of respect by the Greeks. Why would you even bother depicting an enemy? Obviously, he is about to die, but at the same time, memorializing him in this way kind of shared us the idea of how difficult the struggle was, how much honor might be, even in a barbarian, you might be able to find some honor there. The Greeks also increasingly began to show more of the female body, but you can see it happens in kind of an odd way. A lot of the sculptures have drapery covering the body to keep modesty, but you can see that the drapery really clings to part of the body that protrude, but then bunches up around areas that we want to keep hidden. Um, we sometimes refer to this as the wet drapery technique, and you literally can think of it like a wet t-shirt contest. It makes the fabric cling to the body in places and not in others. So it does allow us to show the femininity while retaining some modesty there. As we go from the early Greek era into the Hellenistic, you can see we even begin to depict old people Right? You can see that the female body is still clothed, but she's beginning to be healed where it's acceptable, where it is non-sexualized. Definitely the Hellenistic era gives us some of the most intense emotions and dynamic sculptures, and this particular group, uh, sculptural group, was unearthed in Italy during the lifetime of Michelangelo. He actually came to see it when it was finally uncovered. 
So you can kind of imagine that hyper amount of um, muscular musculature that uh, that Michelangelo puts into his paintings and statues really does sort of come from the classical era. So they're literally reviving the art of the past. Just like we saw in the statues, you can see the same evolution in Greek art in the vase painting. You can see these um, early examples of human figures being made from simple geometric shapes and black shapes against the reddish color of the clay itself. These are funeral markers, so if you zoom in there, you can see the dead body being mourned. You can see the wife and the children at a smaller scale, and you can see the mourners lined up at the funeral, and these are their tears falling down. That style leads to this and then to this. This is known as black figure painting and red figure painting. The black figure is black silhouette with the details incised into the glaze or slip. This doesn't really allow you uh, to do as much detail as you might think, so the Greeks reversed it and gave us this black background shape around the outside of the red figures, allowing you to paint detail with the slip in the interior of the form. It creates a more three-dimensional effect. You can definitely see the advantage here of the red figure over the black. It's just easier to see those details as dark lines on a light field than it is over here in its companion piece. The architecture follows the same format. It starts kind of stocky. It becomes a little bit more elegant. It becomes over the top, just like the sculpture, just like the painting. So you want to remember these three styles of architecture. The Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian orders. You can tell them apart by the capital, the top of the column. The Doric is the simple drum. The Ionic has the curlicues of what we call the volutes. And the Corinthian is stylized carvings of acanthus leaves. There's actual examples to kind of help you see those. Doric, Ionic, Corinthian. And you'll see these um, architectural details being used even in contemporary architecture right in our own town. It's kind of interesting to pair up the sculptures with the temples. You can see how stocky the temple is and how stocky the sculpture would be at the same time of the Doric style. The Ionic becomes more what we expect to see from ancient Greece. The Corinthian gets a little too tall, a little over decorative, a little wiggly. You can kind of see the progression of the styles as we go across there. The Greeks practiced a polytheistic religion. They believed that their gods lived on Mount Olympus, so temples would be on an elevated space. This is the Acropolis in Athens, city on a hill, a uh, city of temples. And the high um, religious ceremony of the year would be bringing a garment of peplos to the cult statue of Athena, and a procession would wind through the streets of Athens as they made their way up to the Acropolis to present the statue with her new cloak each year. The large cult statue has long since been lost, ivory and gold. You can imagine why. The building itself, the main temple um, to Athena at the Acropolis, Acropolis, the part has severely been damaged, but you can see from the floor plan that it would have had post and lentil construction around the outside. It would then have an ambulatory space that you could walk, and then these solid walls that would protect these two inner chambers, and only the priests and the highborn would be able to go into those. The rest of us would be able to walk around the outside. So really the worship would kind of take place around the outside of the building for most common people. You can see in the solid wall, you can see in front of it this row of columns. You can see a continuous frieze there. On the outside of the Acropolis, you would see the frieze sculpture would alternate between these triglyphs, the three-pronged area, or three columns, and then these sculptural reliefs as well. The sculptures would also occur at the front and rear of the temple in the pediment, the triangular area above the door. So the continuous frieze um, is not really a Doric style. Uh, it's a little bit of a combination of the Doric and the Ionic style on the Parthenon. But what you're seeing is the procession bringing the peplos to the goddess. You can see these are the common people walking through the streets. 
Here we have one of the weirdest buildings on that site. It incorporates a number of holy sites, um, including a, sp a place where it was believed that Poseidon and Athena had fought each other for control of the city to be the patron god of the city, uh, and that Poseidon threw his trident down um, in an attempt to hit Athena, and then it hit the ground, and that a spring of water came from there, and that also is incorporated by this building. But I wanted you to see this odd porch on the side in which the figures, or the columns rather, are carved to be statues or figures of human women. Notice that their necks are strengthened by having this braid of hair running down the back. We'll see several references to this throughout the semester. Moving from Greece to Rome, not that you need to know the uh, memorize the dates necessarily, but the Roman history breaks down pretty simply into uh, the period known as the Republic, then the establishment of the empire, during which, of course, the emperor is given massive amount of control and power over the Senate and over the society in general. During the era of the Roman Empire, um, Rome absorbs Greece. Uh, eventually, it also absorbs uh, Egypt under Cleopatra, and eventually it will become so large that the empire will actually be split in half. Um, there's an attempt to do that under the Emperor Diocletian. The decision was made to create uh, two Caesars and two Augustuses, and they would uh, rule four states all co-equal, that did not work well. So Constantine reconsolidates power under a single emperor. He's also the emperor who makes it officially legal to practice uh, Christianity in the empire about 300 years after Christ's death. Uh, he then moves his capital uh, to Byzantium, which is renamed Constantinople in his honor, and that's sort of the thing at the end. The empire then splits in half permanently after the reign of Constantine. So some things to recognize as important Roman innovations are the absorption of ideas from other cultures and making them more efficient. So the Romans invent concrete and they use it in construction of these massive building projects. You can see here in the Colosseum, the construction includes Doric style columns on the first level, Ionic on the second, Corinthian on the third as the building kind of grows. You can see the use also of the rounded arch in not only the Colosseum, but also here in Pont de Gare, this aqueduct that also functions as a road. This allows us to create irrigation, to irrigate farms, to get water into settlements. Uh, the Romans were really very similar to us in that they liked to live in cities, to have apartments even. Um, running water was not unheard of. So what the Romans are doing is really using um, technology from other cultures that they encounter and incorporating it into their own. They're really advancing Greek architecture through the use of that rounded arch as well, because of course, if you're building straight up and straight across in the post and lentil style, you have to have multiple posts um, to be able to support any uh, great length of uh, span across space. So to make a more effective bridge, instead of having a flat lintel, they're using the technology of the round arch, which allows them to place the support posts further and further apart. It's really a remarkable accomplishment. You can kind of see that here as we're trying to reach higher a round arch will allow me to span this space and achieve a higher height. If I keep making uh, higher and rounder uh, arches, I can space out those supports further and further apart. The Romans also took the Greek temple design and changed it a little bit. It's still a rectangular form. This is the Roman basilica. Instead of having the entrance on the short ends, they've moved the entrances to the long ends. And on the short ends, they've added these rounded elements known as apps uh, or and apps or apses. This is a public building. This is a space where you would go to conduct public business, to sign deeds, mortgages, etc. Um, and it's a style that really takes the idea of the uh, original Greek temple and turns it a little inside out. You see, now we have this colonnade on the inside of the building, creating hallways around a large central space. 
uh, Christian architects are going to take this idea and alter it just slightly and create what we know as the Christian cathedral. So using these innovations of arches and concrete, we have this bizarre um, new style of, of architecture. The Pantheon looks like it wants to be a Greek temple on the outside, and then when you walk into it, instead of a rectangle, you're inside of a perfect spherical circle. A remarkable structure. Those are really important examples, I think, when you look at what our architecture looks like in America very early in the federal era of architecture in this country, not long after the War for Independence, we began construction on these buildings that were meant to symbolize that our government, though new, had its connection to the governments of the past, to the uh, Senate of ancient Rome, for example. When you think about it, there's no reason at all why our buildings on this continent should look like Greek and Roman temples. But it gives those buildings a sense of history. It makes them immediately look like they've been there for thousands of years, which is really kind of the point. The Romans are all very similar to us in that they liked things to look like what they really looked like in the real world. They had a tradition that we know as veristic sculpture, making sculpture that looked exactly like how people looked in their real lives. If you had a double chin, you were going to have a double chin in your statue. If you were wrinkly, you were going to be wrinkly. If you had warts, you were going to have warts. The reality was more important to them than making the figures absolutely perfect. So whereas the Greeks aimed for idealism, the Romans aimed for a bit more verism, a bit more reality. That's true even in their statues of their leaders. Here are Emperors Trajan and Emperor Hadrian. Definitely as the culture expanded, though, we started to have problems. So here we have the first uh, real emperor. This is Emperor Augustus or Emperor Octavian. And at the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the era during which Rome was ruled by two Cesare and two Auguste. And they look like they're supposed to be brothers in arms, like embracing in unity. But don't they look scared? Don't they look kind of freaked out? You can kind of sense that the... Um, Sculpture is less believable. It's less naturalistic. The proportions are off. You can kind of feel art starting to fall a little downhill as we go closer to the uh, end of the um, empire. Definitely when Constantine comes along, he reunifies things, and he does so by making monumental sculpture. The proportions may not be perfect, but it's huge. He also makes monuments to himself and takes statuary from earlier emperors takes it off their monuments and sticks it on his. So he's really good at using art as a propagandistic tool to show his power. But you can see that the sculpture from his own time period is a little more like what we're used to seeing in the Middle Ages, a little bit less believable. The proportions are a little off, the heads are too big, the bodies are too small. The Romans also were experts at wall painting, um, and they did so in a variety of different styles. One of my personal favorite styles is the one that creates the illusion that there is no way you're looking out of a window and you can see the beginnings of really good one and two point perspective as if this space continues on. These are your neighbors going back in, in space through that illusionistic opening. We certainly can see a lot of these examples in Pompeii, and there's also a really strong tradition of still life painting that's very similar to the kind of painting that we expect in Europe in the uh, Renaissance and into the Book era. Really beautiful work. Pure landscape for its own sake, creating the illusion that the room is not even there, that it continues on into a garden is pretty typical. There are also, of course, a variety of different religions being practiced in Rome, um, not only Christianity, which was for a time a cult religion and was illegal to practice, but a variety of other uh, religious uh, cults were practiced in uh, the Roman Empire as well, and that's what you're seeing here in the Dionysic mystery frieze. We're not exactly sure every detail of what's going on in this example, but you do get a sense of uh, ritual that combines music, sensuality, dance, 
um, and sacrifice as well. As we move into the Middle Ages, one of the things to be aware of is what happened after Rome, um, how art changed, and why the Renaissance artists are celebrated for going back and reviving the styles and techniques of the Greeks and Romans. When I was in school, we called the Middle Ages the Dark Ages quite often, and the implication was that the art got bad during this time between the fall of Rome and the Renaissance. We can look at two major styles, the Romanesque and the Gothic, and that's really our most important examples. We can think about how the art is different, though, and that to me is the most important thing. It's not that this is bad. In fact, this would be really difficult to reproduce if you tried to do this by hand right now. These kinds of um, illuminated manuscripts, illustrated books, are very much a product of a focus, a change in focus in people's lives from the hedonism of Rome to the spiritual life of the Middle Ages where people were concentrated more on the afterlife, on the Christian faith than on the polytheistic faiths that had preceded that. So I don't think it's that the art is bad, it's that the purpose of it is different. It's meant for teaching, it's meant for learning, and it's meant to communicate to people who, for the most part, couldn't read. So the images had to be easy to recognize, hence their simplicity. Now that may look like a badly drawn cartoon compared to the Roman uh, images that you saw earlier, but it communicates its idea really, really quickly and easily. Definitely as the early phases of the Middle Ages you can see this transition from kind of taking Roman ideas and translating them into Christian ideology is still having some um, kind of odd end results where the proportions don't feel realistic. But I don't think you have to be a genius to understand the story of Adam and Eve from this rather simplistic, somewhat cartoonesque depiction. It's very much what the art of the early Middle Ages does. It makes things maybe less believable. This bizarre perspective here is kind of hard to wrap your mind around, but it tilts the page up so you can see the figures writing a book of the gospel. It makes its ideas very, very, very clear. During the Middle Ages, one of the main things that you would be expected to do as a good Christian would be to travel from church to church along a pilgrimage route, which would lead you through France to the church of Santiago de Compostela. If you were wealthy enough, you would then depart from Compostela on a trip to the Holy Land, and that was very much expected you would venerate different um, icons as you went from church to church. And so these objects, known as reliquaries, were statues and other objects that house remains of saints. You would be able to pray to them intercession and a variety of different um, for a variety of different outcomes. There were saints who specialized in helping cure the sick, for instance. Very often those statues contain the bones of the saints. So you can see how the Greek temple becomes the Roman Basilica. And if we take that Roman Basilica and keep one of the round ends, put a doorway on the opposite end, keep those columns running around the inside, solid wall on the outside, if we add just one other element, boom, that crossing aisle, you've invented the Catholic cathedral. And so it really is an evolution from one culture to the next that's continuing this um, building tradition. and adapting it to different needs. So when we look at the architecture of the earliest phase of the Middle Ages, the Romanesque, we call it that because it's similar to Rome, round arches, right, round arches. And this looks really tall when you see the size of people inside this church, but this is tiny compared to what's gonna come in the Gothic era, the second phase of the Middle Ages. And so the buildings or the, the goal of having a grand church with lots of reliquaries in it that people would want to come to see was also partially uh, a way of driving an economy and of building a culture. So we move from the Romanesque style you can see that the sculpture doesn't feel realistic the way the Roman style did, but it certainly teaches a message. This is a Romanesque uh, tympan, it's a sculpture above the main entrance in the church. This is Christ returning in judgment, and he's got on one side angels taking the saved up to heaven. On the other side, you see angels and demons weighing souls and casting the damned down into hell. So it's not subtle, but it definitely communicates its message.
message. You can see pilgrims carrying uh, bags that have symbols for the pilgrimage through uh, France and the pilgrimage to the Holy Land itself. So a reminder of what you're supposed to do. And look at how scary these demons really are. They're like hybrid fish animal with claws, some kind of lizard fish club hand thing. They're terrifying. And they are forcing the damned souls into this furnace head first. You can see the little feet sticking out there. So definitely the image is not realistic to us, naturalistic, but it certainly gives us a sense of drama and reminds us what the story is about, what to do and not to do. Definitely that round arch allows you to build tall. It also, though, the taller you go is going to require you to move the supports further and further apart, which is great if you're building a bridge. Not so great if you're building a church, because eventually it's going to be so wide, everybody in the congregation could all sit on the front row. So the architect's ages went from the rounded arch to a pointed arch, which allowed them to build taller and taller. But of course, a tall, narrow thing is going to be less stable. So they had to add supports around the outside. That's going to be our flying buttresses and the uh, piers that support them. So it's almost like having an exoskeleton. You can see it here. This would be the exterior wall of the church to this level, exterior here, exterior there. So all of these supports are on the outside of the building, catching the weight, allowing us to put massive amounts of glass in those walls. So you can see that the churches of the Gothic era get taller and elaborate. This now is dwarfing the one that we saw earlier as an example of Romanesque design. This is Notre Dame in Paris. You can see the scale of it. It's just enormous. And that exterior support provides all kinds of places for decorations in terms of gargoyles and statuary and so forth, but it allows the walls to be almost entirely glass from the inside, which really creates a feeling that this transforms everyday space into a spiritual space. When you see light pouring through these colored glass, it really transforms light into something else. So the building, even though it is... Um, on a massive scale is really meant to relate to your feeling in your body. It makes you feel small in the presence of God. It makes you feel transformed by white light from outside transforming into color as it passes through the glass. As we get toward the end of the Gothic era, things get so over the top that they're even adding extra doors. This is a fake doorway here. There's usually three entrances, a main and one on either side. They've added one extra on either side of that. It's kind of hilarious. You can see that the sculpture gets taller and taller and taller and skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. So the proportions are less and less believable, more and more exaggerated. These are known as jam statues, the statues in the door jams. And you can really see that elongation of the form is very un- Greek on Roman. We see in England um, a lot of use of uh, tapestry, of um, fabric design, and this is one of the most famous tapestries in the world. The Bayou Tapestry tells the story of the Norman Conquest. It's 230 feet in length, and you can see that the figures are also tall, thinking kind of cartoon-like, right? But the story is really easy to tell from that image. You can also see some French drawings here that try to reassert the idea of finding the proportions for the geometric base of animal and human forms. It doesn't quite get in perfect, but you can feel that interest is kind of coming back. So as we look across the evolution of these figures, you can kind of see how the simplification of this composite view in ancient Greece translated into the earliest works in from Egypt to ancient Greece. We go from geometric style to black figure to red figure to the white figure that really is almost what a painting on canvas would look like. We can see Roman painting really beginning to feel like what the Renaissance might be and how it would be if this is the level of realism that uh, Renaissance, that uh, Roman painters are able to achieve in the empire. Doesn't the work of the Middle Ages look 
inferior? Doesn't it look less realistic? Doesn't it look more cartoon-like? That's why when somebody like Leonardo comes along, it's a return to this classical world, a return from this kind of cartoon style to something that's more solid. But you can imagine it this way. If we really changed the style in the Middle Ages to be emphasizing people's spirituality over their physicality, then the Renaissance allows us to put both of those things together. What if we had an art that showed real human bodies, but with a spiritual intent? The same thing happens in sculpture. You can see the rigid, fake, and very symbolic kind of sculpture of Egypt becoming more natural and increasing over time. We can see how odd then the statuary of the Middle Ages feels in comparison to the realism of veristic sculpture in Rome and how the Renaissance is really a return to that, but with a spiritual side. If we take stories from the Bible and the style from Greece and Rome and mash them together, we have the Renaissance.